My pleasure. Uh, really tickled to have you both here. So welcome, Mickey. Welcome, David. Um, I thought we'd just jump right in and uh, I could introduce you, but I think you and your work has been evolving and the students know somewhat who you are, what you've been announced, and uh, also the public that is here. Um, would you mind just introducing yourselves and your work with a little more depth? No problem. Do you want me to start or you, would you like David to start? You're fine, Mickey. You want to give us a start? Sure. Hi, everybody. Uh, it's again an honor to be here with you all at San Francisco State University. Um, like many, I do lament that I'm not there in person. Um, although this is this will do the the two dimensional version of me, I think is not as interesting. But we'll <laughs> we'll run through anyway. Um, it was always a pleasure to be there to see everybody and hang out afterwards, and you know, really carry on the conversation. And I think that. Um, I'm hoping at least with what I'm going to do with you all today, and I, I know you're in for a real treat um, because David Talbot is here, um, and uh, he is an amazing uh, contributor to the intersections of history, history historiography, and journalism uh, going from the 20th to the 21st century, so it's an honor to be here with David, um, <clears throat> whom I've been a, a fan of and student of for a couple of few decades now. Um, I, in case you don't know, I'm uh, I'm Mickey Huff. Um, been friends with Ken for a long time. Ken's on the board with us over at the Media Freedom Foundation, where I'm president. The Media Freedom Foundation is the nonprofit that oversees Project Censored, where I'm director. Uh, Project Censored was founded in 1976. It is the oldest existing media watchdog organization in the United States that that um, aims to protect and advance First Amendment causes. Uh, we are a free press organization that believes censorship is anything that interferes with the free flow of information in a society that has free press principles that would include the United States. Um, and we do an annual book. Uh, this is last year's book, Censored 2020. This year, State of the Free Press 2021. Uh, I gave Ken PDFs of these that he could share with you. Um, we do an annual listing of the most underreported stories that the corporate media either missed entirely or grossly distorted. And we have about 20 campuses across the US, 30 faculty, a few hundred students every year. We research and factually vet 300 or more stories every year that our 28 national and international judges distill down to the list that makes it into the book. And we also teach critical media literacy. We have a critical media literacy curriculum. And that's our main concern is education. We want people to understand the importance and significance of free speech and free press rights in democratic Republican societies like ours, warts and all. Uh, we'll get into some of that, of course, uh, in our conversation probably. But uh, that, in a nutshell, that's what I do. I'm chair of the history department, co-chair of history at Diablo Valley College. I am chair of the journalism department and professor of social science, history, and journalism. Here in the Bay, I have lectured in sociology at Sonoma State and communications at Cal State East Bay. Um, my last book was with Andy Lee Roth. That's the censored book here, uh, State of the Free Press 2021. Also, before that, I co-authored with Nolan Higdon, United States of Distraction, Media Manipulation of Post-Truth America, and What We Can Do About It. That's the part we like to focus on, not just the problems, but what are we doing? And not just what can we do, but what are we doing? There are people that are really doing something about these issues, being the media, uh, the new website David started, davidtalbotshow.com. I'm sure he'll talk a little about that. Um, but there are a lot of us out here that are doing uh, this kind of work, and we don't do it by ourselves. And this is also a tacit invitation to all of you. Fortunately, you have Ken as your host and ambassador this semester, uh, and he is a, a, a very... Uh, able guide when it comes to navigating difficult and controversial situations, uh, a lifelong truth seeker. And I think you're really fortunate to have somebody like Professor Burroughs as, uh, as your instructor this semester. So really quickly, before I hand it off to David, so you can find information about us, you can go to projectcensored.org. I put my website and David's recent website in the chat already. I'll be putting more information in there. Um, our recent movie, if you haven't seen it, is United States of Distraction, Fighting the Fake News Invasion. We do documentary films. Uh, Ten years on, I'm also host and executive producer of the Project Censored show that I started with the previous director, Peter Phillips. We're on every, every week, Friday, 1 p.m. KPFA out of Berkeley, California. We're on 50 stations around the U.S., Ken and his students have been on the show usually a couple times a year. We're over, overdue. We're now, of course, in, in the, uh, the season for nonviolence, right, with Gandhi King. And so Ken's going to be on the show soon. 
uh, about this stuff. And uh, I just look forward to talking to you all today and hearing what you have to say, looking forward to interacting with you. So thanks so much again for the invitation. Thanks for having us here and, and thanks, Ken. And with that, I, I hand things over uh, to the great David Talbot. David. Thank you, Mickey. Thank you, Ken. And yeah. good to see all of you. Uh, I, I'm David Talbot and I have spent my whole long life trying to create independent media and uh, kind of tilting at the windmills of corporate media. Uh, I grew up in Hollywood. My dad was a founder of the Screen Actors Guild way, way back. Uh, my son, Joe Talbot, made The Last Black Man in San Francisco, so he's kind of come full circle. This house here in Bernal Heights is kind of a studio where my wife is a writer, I'm a writer, uh, Joe grew up, uh, Jimmy Fails, who was starred in the film, The Last Black Man, uh, grew up here. So, uh, and my youngest son is an activist not much older than you, and is talking all the time about the uh, kind of daunting challenges that your generation has. And uh, his own feeling is that the system has to be completely overturned. And you know, that's kind of the feeling I've had my whole life. Uh, I've been very fortunate and for most of my life have worked for the alternative media. I was an editor at Mother Jones for years in the 80s during the Reagan period, very reminiscent in some ways of Trump and uh, what we've been through lately. Um, I, after that, founded Salon which was one of the first independent media sites online back way back in 1995. Salon is still going <laughs> without me somehow, somehow. Uh, but uh, that was a wild ride for 10 years. Uh, Jeff Bezos at Amazon tried to buy us. The New York Times tried to buy us at one point. But I'm very uh, proud that I resisted those uh, siren calls and kept Salon independent throughout my uh, tenure there. After Salon, I went into writing books uh, about dark history, about uh, the true story of an American power. And I'm very proud of those books. And in particular, I focused on the Kennedy years and the assassinations of uh, both President John Kennedy and his brother, Bobby Kennedy. And uh, my recent book, uh, which will be coming out in June, and I think will be my last history book, I wrote in conjunction with my sister, Margaret Talbot, who's another member of our little empire. Um, she's a writer, uh, you might know her work at the New Yorker magazine. And so Margaret and I have written a book, uh, here it is, I'll show it to you. Can you see it? Nice. All right. Congrats. Yes, it's coming out in uh, June. I can't and wait. <laughs> it's That's our great. attempt to understand what we did, our generation did in the 60s and 70s. I was pretty young, I was a teenager, then I was in my early 20s, but I did get to know people like Bobby Seale, Black Panthers, Tom Hayden, one of the great leaders of the anti-war movement and others. And so we write about these people in this book, the Jane Collective, which was an underground abortion, feminist abortion collective in Chicago that finally got busted by the Chicago police. These were radical young men and women of all races the American Indian Movement taking over Wounded Knee in 1973 in South Dakota. Very brave people put their bodies on the line. And they made mistakes. They were human. They were flawed. But I think we can learn, you, your generation can learn a lot from what they succeeded at doing and what they failed to do. And so that's my latest book and probably my last history book. And finally, uh, as Mickey said, um, I've just decided to cut out the middle men, mostly men, and go directly to uh, people who want to read my thoughts with this blog, The David Talbot Show. And uh, so if you want to read my daily uh, musings, uh, you can read them there. And with that, I'm all yours and all Mickey's. <laughs> well, great to have you both here. Uh, again, a real treat. Um, so David, maybe you could continue a bit if you're willing, uh, this idea of history. So where do we find ourselves and uh, literally who are we and how do we get here? Um, <laughs> yeah. what, can you give us a, a sense of, you know, a quick view of US history, but in, in particular, uh, you know, the last uh, 70, 80 years um, or hundred years, just what's happened to our culture? Um, where, where do we find ourselves as well? 
Well, Ken, that's the question I've been trying to grapple with, you know, very explicitly since 2005, when I began work on my first book about the Kennedy presidency called Brothers. Um, and, you know, I think Arthur Schlesinger said this, he was the historian who worked in the Kennedy White House. He said, history is an ongoing argument. And I think that's very true. We have to keep probing, you know, the, the taboo subjects, the subjects that are locked behind closed doors. That's our job as journalists, as scholars, as historians. Unfortunately, I think for the most part at school and certainly from the media, Ken Burns on PBS and so on and so forth, give us a very mythologized view of American history. And that doesn't help people at all. Because if we can't learn from our history, which is our history, then we're doomed to keep repeating it as the, uh, as the great quote goes. And so uh, my first book was to try to understand what happened to the Kennedy presidency. I was young at, uh, at the time, 12 years old, when JFK was assassinated. I wanted to know why that government, why his administration broke uh, in two. And I think it broke over the Cold War because I think President Kennedy wanted to end the Cold War ahead of his time. And he got a strong blowback from the military industrial complex by the most hardline forces, the national security forces in Washington. And I think they were behind his assassination. Most people, I think Americans do believe that Kennedy was killed by a conspiracy. But of course, you can't say that in corporate media. It still has to uh, be completely uh, tied to Lee Harvey Oswald, the so-called lone gunman. And that's just one example of many, I think. Uh, the true stories about how Amer American power really works are kept hidden from us to this day. And the media, for the most part, the mainstream media, I think goes along with that cover up. And that's why there's so many angry people. I think, you know, 74 million people voted for Donald Trump. And I think a lot of those angry people have legitimate gripes uh, about how they're manipulated by people in power and how uh, information is controlled. And, uh, you know, we are being canceled long before the, can the so called cancel culture. We being independent media people in Hollywood, in New York, in uh, you know any center of um, corporate power in America, it was very difficult for our voice to break through this. That's why I started Salon back in 1995. And th there was a reason I started in San Francisco. I got some money from Silicon Valley backers, but I knew that this place, because particularly then when you could afford to live in San Francisco, had an independent voice. A lot of young journalists breaking through, trying to break through, who couldn't get jobs in LA or New York or any of the main uh, media institutions. But I thought if I could create a national platform here online in San Francisco to, uh, to give those people a voice, then we would have an impact. And we can talk more about that, how I did that with Salon. But you know, people like Michelle Goldberg, who now is a columnist at the New York Times, Jake Tapper at CNN, and many others came up through Salon. I'm very proud of what we were able to do. That's wonderful. Well, uh, Mickey, would you like to add to that? Absolutely, thank you, Ken. And thank you, David, um, for that great, uh, exposition and introduction to those intersections of history and journalism. And it is true that nowadays, uh, cancel culture is all the rage and getting a lot of attention, particularly online through social media and deplatforming. Um, and so maybe we'll talk a little bit about that too. But David is right. Uh, censorship is as old as uh, history itself. And there's we always have to ask um, who's in control of the narratives, whose voices get to be heard, and then de facto, which ones do not. And the role of journalism, the role of the free press and purportedly free societies is to elevate all of the voices. It's to create a sense of equity among the people of a society so that our views are heard. Um, free speech, free, free press, those issues aren't just about um, having you know, the right to say anything. The ancient Greeks had a term called parisia, which meant to say anything, right? Fearless speech in fateful times, as we wrote about in previous Project Censored books. But in, in the United States, through Supreme Court rulings and interpretations, particularly through the 20th century, those also mean the right to be heard, right? And so we find ourselves in the 21st century in an incredibly 
bizarre, uh, technopolistic or technocratic dystopian sort of digital landscape of information where we're drowning in a sea of information, but we have a paucity of understanding and critical thinking about how to sift through it. And increasingly, we have powerful forces and algorithms and bots and programmers behind the scenes that are plucking out different voices and stories and the ones that they don't want you to see and pounding down on you with the things that they think that you already see uh, as a matter of your own selection, right? And so how did we get here? Was the big million dollar or billion dollar or trillion dollar, I don't know what the inflation is for dollars these days with this stuff, um, since I'm not a money guy. <laughs> but as, as an, I, am, I am an idea person uh, in many ways, like, like I think David is and Ken is. Um, and I, I, there's a long history, again, as I'm gonna re repeat this, of people that own the press, people that own the means of production that are trying to control the information that that we, the people, have access to. And it filters all the way through education. The idea that people who get a, a liberal education, so to speak, are, are open-minded or liberated or know what's going on in the world, that's not necessarily true. You know, if you go back and look at uh, linguists and critics like Noam Chomsky, he often said that, you know, the higher up the ladder you go, the more indoctrinated one becomes. And they are educated, but they come out and espouse platitudes to support the establishment and the status quo. And this is why people like David Talbot had to start salon.com uh, is because, and this is why we're on KPFA. You know, this is why we started Project Censored. This is why Carl Jensen started Project Censored in 1976. It was to look at what the news was failing to cover and how it affected us as a society and how it affected all corners of our society and the globe, not just the elites, not just the shareholders, not just the owners of the press, right? In the 20th century, A.J. Liebling once said that, you know, if you, the best way to ensure your right to a free press is to own one. Well, truer words were never spoken. Um, but that's not how democratic culture ought to work. And what we do at Project Censored is we try to empower people to understand how these systems of information dissemination work and also become uh, I would say responsible stewards of information and narration and storytelling of their own and support independent journalistic outlets that tell the truths and shine the light into the dark places that corporate media can't or won't touch. And if they do touch it, they'll spin it and distort it to benefit a particular agenda. All the while they crow about how we have this very myopic area where we can viciously disagree. Republicans versus Democrats, Biden versus Trump. Look at us go like whirling dervishes. More importantly, get out of the box in the circle and look at everything else that's going on that they either won't address or only address in one-dimensional ways or two-dimensional ways. And you know, I saw somebody in the in the um, in the in the chat already talk about the CIA. David could talk about the CIA all day long. Um, you know, Ralph McGahey, a CIA whistleblower, uh, once quipped. I'm going to paraphrase him here because we wrote an article about this in a journal, and our film riffs on this. Our recent film is that today's fake news is tomorrow's fake history. If you don't get it right today, you're imprinting into people's minds an idea that they begin to accept, especially if it comes from purportedly trustworthy sources that we're, we're trained to accept. The New York Times couldn't possibly get a story wrong, or if they did, they'd correct it. And they don't, get th they don't miss things. In fact, the mantra at the New York Times is all the news that's fit to print, which implies that if it's not in the New York Times, it's not newsworthy. We like to say that it's all the news that fits the print. And the print is the frame that is ideologically approved in a neoliberal system. And then we have news that occurs in there, but anything outside of that frame is considered, well, fake news, right? And again, you know, Ralph McGahey and the CIA were talking about this decades ago because the CIA was actively involved in manipulating new in the uh, news coming out of the newsroom that goes back to Executive Order 1035-960. That was the effort in 1967 and 8 to silence critics of the Warren Commission, which is where, you know, David Talbot's expertise comes in in the assassination of the Kennedys. They tried to silence critics of the Kennedy assassination because they didn't want to create a mass generation of unrest that was already unfolding before them. Right. Well, Mickey, Mickey, if I could jump in yeah, here, jump because in, David. I, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. I, I think finally, and this is happening cinematically, you know, we're finally le learning out about how uh, authority uh, did sort of uh, exert itself in the 1960s and 70s, often violently to repress dissident uh, leaders and so on. We now have the film, which I think is an important film, uh, Judas and the Black Messiah about the uh, outrageous assassination of one of the youngest, most charismatic 
black leaders in America, Fred Hampton, only 21 when they shot him in his bed. They drugged him and shot him in his bed next to his pregnant wife, the Chicago police and the FBI. Outrageous assassination. And I was a kid younger than you guys even when it happened. And we couldn't believe that the Nixon administration, the FBI under J. Edgar Hoover and the Chicago cops, which are reactionary violent force, just as they are today, unfortunately, uh, would do that, have the kind of you know utter gall to kick in his door and shoot him while he was sleeping next to his pregnant wife. Uh, so finally, that information, what is it now? You know, 50 years later or more than a half century later, it's coming out through this great film that's getting a lot of attention. The other day, just about you know a few days ago, ABC News reported that a undercover cop, an African-American cop working for the New York Police Department was part of the operation to kill uh, Malcolm X. Yeah. Another holy shit story that should have been picked up and should have been on the front page, as Mickey was saying, the New York Times, which is so supposedly still the arbiter of what is important news. That story should have been splashed everywhere that, yes, now we're finally learning out about Malcolm X. Now, Malcolm X is back in the news. Why? Not only because of this revelation, but because of another movie, One Night in Miami, another great film where Malcolm X is portrayed very brilliantly by a British actor. And so once again, we're slowly starting 50, 60 years later to find out about our dark history as a nation. We have to know about this. Why? Because the next leader that comes along who has the kind of charisma and power and uh, talent and uh, spirituality, frankly, of a, of a uh, Martin Luther King or a Malcolm X or a Fred Hampton or a Bobby Kennedy, they could be killed too. And we have to protect these people who speak for us. Uh, so these films are very important. Uh, I think that the media continues to refuse to grapple with the true meaning of these stories and deep sixism puts them down a black hole of our social amnesia as quickly as they do emerge. But it's up to us and up to your generation as young activists and as young media workers to make sure that stories like that don't get ignored. And actually that's exactly what Project Censored came into being to do is to highlight the stories that the corporate media can't seem to be drawn to or can't seem to report. And uh, that started in 1976 with Carl Jensen. Notice the timing there, right after Watergate, right after Nixon resigns, right after, um, right after we see the cracking open of the Frank uh, Commission, I'm sorry, the Frank Church Commission and the Pike Commissions that uh, were spawned by um, going back to the early 1970s after the Kent State shooting and the P Pentagon Papers, we had in Media Pennsylvania, uh, the finding of what be, what was later known as the COINTELPRO, the Co counterintelligence program that David was just referencing, that was assassinating leaders. H highly possible they're involved in JFK. They're definitely involved in what's going on with Martin Luther King, with Bobby Kennedy, who was shot in the back of the head at point blank range, not from six feet away from Sirhan Sirhan, yet he's still in prison. Malcolm X is now coming out. We could go on and on with this unhistory, as Noam Chomsky might call it, or as Oliver Stone, who did the great JFK film, Stone and Kuznick call it, um, our untold histories, right? And in many cases, what Project Censor does is the journalistic version of the first rough draft of history. And those are these very important stories that are accurate and they're factual, but most people don't see them unless they go looking for them, which is why we teach critical media literacy education so that people can broaden their news media diets and they can begin to understand why the stuff that's the easiest and most accessible is not always the most accurate or most comprehensive. So with that- you know, Ken, and, and that also speaks to another thing, Mickey, I think that's important for uh, particularly students to take note of. Uh, my colleague, Karen Croft, who did a lot of research on my books with me, she and I have a saying that the best story wins. The best story wins. Mm -hmm. And that was certainly the case with Oliver Stone and JFK. Uh, mm -hmm. You're too young to remember it, uh, 
all of you, but that film had a major impact on the public when it came out way back in 1991. In fact, finally forced Congress to release uh, every document they could get their hands on under the JFK Records Collection Act. The CIA, of course, refused and stonewalled and wouldn't release its documents. But thousands of pages of documents related to the Kennedy presidency were released, and many of which I used as a historian on, on my both my books, uh, the Brothers and also uh, the Devil's Chessboard, which was about the CIA. Um, and so I think, you know, media can be important. And if you know how to tell the story and you put it into, I think, a form that the public responds to, I think that you can have a major impact. I was very proud, I am very proud of both Jimmy Fails and Joe Talbot, my sons, uh, to make who made The Last Black Man in San Francisco. Because we were all talking about gentrification. We we're all talking about how you can't afford to live in the city anymore. People like us, artists, writers, activists, being pushed out of the city uh, by the rise of the tech industry. Um, and, uh, and yet, you know, it took that film to dramatically capture, I think, the kind of great frustration and sorrow that so many people, uh, particularly, I think, you know, African American families who've lived here for years are experiencing because of uh, gentrification. So, you know, my kind of uh, challenge to all of you is not just become good reporters and become people who read the news like Mickey uh, so often uh, urges people to do, read the news very aggressively, actively, and find out the truth by becoming, you know, moles that you have to do to, to burrow here and there throughout uh, the media landscape to find the truth. But also, if you're becoming a media journalist, if you're becoming a, a media professional, then find the skills to tell your story, whether it's in film, video, podcasting, or uh, in text. Uh, tell your story in a way that's compelling and learn your story and know it so well that you can tell it with great authority and with great, I think, feeling. And with music, right? So many different mediums, so many different ways. And Ken, if I could, before you're gonna talk, uh, guide us in another direction, I wanted to address one thing that sure. you asked about how we got here. And I'm gonna do this as an historian and a journalist, that's impossible to do in, in a Twitter uh, soundbite, but I'm gonna do it very quickly because we outlined it in the United States of Distraction book. And I've got a great quote here from Lao Tzu that says, if you do not change direction, you may end up where you are heading. Are <laughs> we there yet? <laughs> We've been heading here for quite some time. I know a lot of folks after the 2016 election were like, we're inundated by fake news and reality TV presidents and what's going on? Look, we've been heading here for a long time. There would be no Donald Trump without Rush Limbaugh. Right. And in many cases, there would be no Rush Limbaugh without the John Birchers, and there would be none of that without Father Coughlin. Mm -hmm. History is not just a straight line, it's a series of looped relationships that we need to really understand how they affect us in the present. And what do we go back and grab? And what lessons do we look at? And why? And how do they then propel us into the future? So, we, Nolan Higdon and I, came up with four succinct uh, sort of explanations about how we got where we are in this so-called post-truth world, right? Which, which exemplifies an epistemological crisis in ways. And I already see people in the chat room talking about, um, well, we've got to seek out the trusted sources and we've got to look at the unbiased sources. Good luck with that because there aren't any. Um, there are some trusted individuals and there are organizations that have more trustworthy track records than others based on transparently sourced evidence. But you know, just like we say with the New York Times, even though the New York Times has done some things that have been fantastic in terms of reporting, they've also dropped the ball massively on various issues from supporting the coup in Venezuela to one of the people in class knew about Judith Miller lying about WMDs uh, in Iraq. So the four things that we pointed to here over the last 50 years, one, We've had an increased pervasive commercial entertainment culture, and it's permeated journalism. It's, it, it's bled through every element and every institution of our society. Rampant commercialism and for-profit motives from the capitalist economy. The second is that it's also fueled partisan, hyper-partisanship, and our social media habits play to our confirmation bias that create <laughs> media silos 
They create our own partisan media silos and I have my sources and you have your sources. So somehow we never seem to be speaking the same language about the subjects that are going on around us. And so we need to be really mindful about how information has become hyper-partisan. Um, the other thing that we pointed out, there's two other things that we pointed out that I want to uh, that I want to get to, and then I'll turn things back over. In addition to hyperpartisanship, I just mentioned the other. Because of these silos, we have a greatly fragmented media landscape, especially corporate media. And when we see poll after poll, we see people that skew liberal or to the Democratic side of things go to CNN or MSNBC or the New York Times or the Washington Post. And people that skew conservative go to Fox News, uh, Breitbart, AM Radio, OAN, uh, these types of sources, Wall Street Journal, maybe. Um, so we do have a very fragmented media landscape. And it's not that we didn't have partisanship and bias in the past. What we have now are we have different sides of these ideological coins trying to to merely cater to a particular ideological constituency. Because Fo Roger Ailes from the Reagan administration nailed it with Fox News in 1996 after the collapse of the Fairness Doctrine. There's always gonna be four or five million people that wanna hear this kind of right-wing ide ideological information and bias, and they'll watch it every day. So the profit motive is there. Likewise, you'll see MSNBC try to replicate those kinds of models. So we have a fragmented media landscape. And the fourth thing that we saw that really contributed to getting us to where we are now is an ineffective education system. Uh, the free press system is how the general public is educated. The educational system is how we groom and condition people uh, to become thinking and productive adults that are civically engaged. Garbage in, garbage out. If you're only telling people certain parts of a story and certain things, you can't expect for people when they're older to understand the complexity of stories, which is why people that haven't been taught about white supremacy, people that haven't been taught about systemic racism, and they don't see it in their daily lives, they're suspect of it. And they don't necessarily understand why they were never taught this. And so we also spend a lot of time in our work talking about compassionate communication, as Ken has done a lot of with constructive media literacy. And we talk a lot about how we talk to each other as being as important as what we think we're communicating. Because mostly what people will remember is my tone of voice or my tenor or my word choice. And, or They'll remember the interaction. They may not remember what I say, but they might remember that. And if I approach people in ways that it is um, it, where I'm interested in them hearing me, which means I'm interested in hearing them, we can try to create a reciprocal or a, a cyclic relationship of sharing of information. And in fact, that's the topic of a new book Nolan and I are doing right now for Rutledge called Let's Agree to Disagree. But with that, Ken, I'll hand over to you. Mm -hmm. Well, this is uh, such a great, uh, lo I love what we're doing. I love it. Um, also, this hyper partisanship uh, often is showing up in our own our own circles. Uh, the social justice movement is very righteous, oftentimes about uh, how they define white supremacy, so and, and identity politics. And so, I think uh, every group. Um, but just back to this whole idea of being an activist for a moment. I hear you both calling um, people out to um, to pick that up and to pick up this whole idea that our history is hidden from us. But once people start really getting clear about um, how challenging it is to look at our history and, and the power dynamics and the, um, the, the cost of really looking at this is often that people end up uh, feeling de a de bit depressed and uh, that they often buy out of feeling they can do anything. So uh, the whole institutionalization of power. And um, I, I've asked many of my students over the years, uh, why do you think your generation is less likely to feel involved and they say well it doesn't really matter what we do so here you both had lives of really being actively doing things and i know david for for years you wanted to get it if, I, if i'm right a tv show going that would actually be a, a regular announcement of these themes and you were in la trying to produce that show and then soon thereafter you had a stroke and <laughs> you've written about your stroke right and the pressures you were under trying to get this to happen uh, it, this is difficult work. And so what are your thoughts, especially having gone through that? Um, how does one be a social change agent in the world and um, not get too stuck in your own partisanship and polarization and fears and concerns? Yeah, that's a good question, Ken. Um, you know, 
I understand what uh, Mickey was saying earlier about the, how the entertainment values have corrupted uh, journalism to a, a great extent in America and how Roger Ailes at Fox News was uh, part of that process by uh, creating his you know, dramatic stories of the day and his kind of uh, fembots, his blonde fembots and his anchors who are stars in their own right and so on. But, you know, I met with Roger uh, when he was riding high uh, at Fox News back in the early 2000s. And we were saying, look, if you really are serious about being fair and balanced, then you should have a show from the left. And right. you should uh, build a show around Salon, which was very, had a lot of buzz at the time, was the progressive kind of uh, digital platform. And, you know, he toyed with us, but he was never going to give us an hour on the, the Fox network to do a salon. But I did come to respect him in many ways. He was a loathsome creature, a racist, a sexist. We now know how outrageous he was with women and so on. Um, and, you know, a hardcore propagandist for the right. But you got to give him credit that he knew how to frame news and he knew how to build an audience. And so I don't dismiss those kind of skills. And I did go, you're right, to Hollywood after I wrote my history books. Uh, they were optioned by Hollywood Studios. Uh, some big names, uh, including, you know, well, I won't name the names, big directors uh, wanted to make TV, dramatic TV series based on the Devil's Chessboard, which is an amazing story, by the way, because it tells American history starting with the uh, World War II uh, and how you know, there were certain elements of American uh, intelligence, including Alan Dulles, who later became head of the CIA, that were, who were collaborating with the Nazis in, in Europe during World War II, a very dark history. And it's finally starting to come out now with books like Ratline, which was what they called the kind of escape route the Nazis used over the Alps down through Italy and to South America. A wonderful new book by a guy named Philippe Sands who lost most of his family in the Holocaust in Middle Europe during World War II, and then went on an amazing journey where he meets the uh, son of the man who was head of the SS, uh, the top Nazi official, who was responsible for the uh, execution of his uh, relatives. Uh, it's an amazing book, and I recommend it highly, and, and, and he made a documentary uh, based on this book as well. So I, I give great credit to people who are able to frame the stories in compelling, entertaining ways. I went to Hollywood because I was determined that my history books should have a wider audience, and I wanted to make them into dramatic uh, TV series uh, and films. And so they were <laughs> optioned again and again. And yes, in my latest memoir, which I wrote last year, um, Between Heaven and Hell, I have a chapter called Hollywood Gave Me a Stroke because uh, I remember the day very clearly where I was in a meeting with Hollywood directors and producers and writers. Uh, and it was insane. It was like being in Alice in Wonderland. There's a element to Hollywood that is so frustrating for a person who thinks logically and, and in a linear way uh, because Hollywood doesn't. Uh, and it, it's full of artifice. It's all the cliches you've heard about Hollywood are true. I grew up in Hollywood, like I said. My dad was an old movie actor. My son now, God bless him, is back in Hollywood. So the family story continues there. But for me, being a lonely book writer in Hollywood was a very frustrating experience and still is. To this day, uh, there are big names who are, uh, have optioned my books who are, I now have to deal with them again. But I have to say I'm dealing with it in a more Zen-like fashion now. You can't get caught up in it emotionally or spiritually or psychologically. It will drive you crazy. It will give you a stroke <laughs> as it did me. Uh, fortunately, I survived. Um, and my son, Joe, I had great trepidation about him. I went on the set after I recovered from my stroke when he was shooting the last black man in San Francisco on the street in San Francisco. It was a complete madness. If you've ever been on a set, hundred people running around, laying cable, uh, blocking traffic, policemen, uh, you know, actors getting very nervous before the scene, getting into character. Uh, and Joe was this kind of calm presence at the eye, in the eye of the storm. And I thought, wow, you know, he's learned from his old man that you can't really uh, you know, take this stuff, uh, internalize it too strongly. 
and, and let it take over your life. You have to know who you are and you have to keep your head about you. And frankly, as a young director, he has more power than I ever did as a writer, a book writer. So, um, you know, I really sympathize with all of you, all of you students who see yourself, you know, after graduation going into the media industry. It's a, it's a terrible beast, but it's worth grappling with and fighting with. And a Scoop Nisker, who's a great underground FM radio newscaster back in the 60s, here in San Francisco once said, if you don't like the news, then go out and make some of your own. And that's what I did with Salon and my independent media. That's what Mickey's doing and others that we've uh, helped along the way. And I think that's what a lot of you can do. You, you have to act tribally. You have to put it together like you're putting together a band. That's how I started Salon. They were all journalists who I respected and loved, men, women, uh, you know, from all backgrounds. And when we put ourselves together, and we had power because no one knew what the internet was at that point, the web. They thought the, the World Wide Web was some international tennis tournament. And <laughs> no, one, no one knew what the web was in 1995. Yeah. And so we had the, uh, we had the uh, advantage of surprise. And we did exactly what we wanted to do for 10 years. And it was great. It was a great run. And so that's my uh, hope and wish for all of you, too. Great. Uh, that's perfect. Thank you, David. Uh, Mickey, um, just we should shift to the state of the free press as part of our, our dance here. Um, what are your thoughts about, I know the latest uh, Center 2021 is uh, carried down as a byline. And David, I'd love to return before we finish just to your thoughts about uh, what uh, future activists might do and how to think about it. So just to let that stir in your teacup. Uh, so um, how about the state of the free press, Mickey? What's, uh, what are your thoughts there? There's probably just a great book on it as we begin to narrow our time here. <clears throat> I want to make sure we, we get that in. Well, my, um, I am fortunate to have many partners in, in, uh, <laughs> in my thought crimes. Uh, so I, I work with a lot of wonderful people. Uh, I've been really blessed that way. And like what David was riffing on, it's really important to um, sort of know your compass, know who you are and what you can do. And uh, also know, um, you know, not to internalize so many things. And I've learned, I, David's last book was, has been helpful to me. I just turned 50 uh, and I'm going 500 miles an hour in every direction all the time. And that's not sustainable. Um, and so uh, fortunately, I also have a, a gene in me that's a collaborator gene, <laughs> right? And uh, so that's how I've gotten to meet so many amazing people. And I've been so blessed to meet, you know, I grew up in a, like a tin, I grew up in a working class town in Western Pennsylvania that, you know, by the time I was seven or eight, it had collapsed because the steel industry collapsed. So, you know, I, I didn't grow up in the Bay Area in, in San Francisco. I didn't escape until 99, um, get out to, to Berkeley. But um, what I along this route, I've met so many different people that have been so helpful at me understanding why it's important to collaborate, and I'm now coming back to journalism. So it, what we do at Project Censored is we are critical of the corporate press. Um, we are, but we are also affirmative, right? We we affirm when the when the press does the right story, when they get it right, when they source it, when it's an important thing, they don't miss it, right? So we don't just rag on the New York Times or the Washington Post, though we do. Um, we also point out when they're doing things that we think the free press has a role to do. But we don't just sit around and ignore all the other journalism, independent and alternative journalism. You know, Carl Jensen, when he started Project Censored, had the good, um, good sense and fortune to know um, uh, Bruce Brugman at the uh, one of the oldest uh, weeklies in the country, the San Francisco Bay Guardian. And that's how Project Censored started to get their top 10 list out. And that influenced people all over the country, including Jello Biafra in San Francisco, and used some of those stories to write dead Kennedy punk lyrics. You know, and I grew up playing punk and 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 speed metal. And so that's how I started to, to get into that. And then I started to get into all these different networks of these different independent and alternative cultures that you didn't see anywhere in the corporate media, right? And so I always had this inquisitiveness about what else is out there and what else can I do? So as part of my career as an educator, a professor, what have you, we put these books together. They're full of hundreds of people 
hundreds of people, dozens of organizations, institutions, people, scholars, journalists, and we do it every year and it's different every year. And so people are always like, where do you go for information? And where do I go to get to? Look, it's all in here. This is not the be all end all, but it's a great place to start for people who feel overwhelmed by the din of the propaganda noise machine, right? And so my advice is to build allies, build relationships, work with people, not against people. Uh, competition is an interesting phantom that seems to motivate some of us. But in the end, competition, if you go all the way back to the root of the word, it really means about how do you work together towards a common goal to improve a situation or to get somewhere where you're going, right? And so I think cooperation is a really great way to work in journalistic circles, to build co-ops, um, and to you know, really grow uh, the information databases that we all access and share our networks of information with each other. Um, because to me, that's how we're going to create, you know, the next George Seldes. That's where you're going to see the next Ida Tarbell. That's where you're going to, I mean, I'm reaching back into the history books here, but that's where you're going to see, you know, the next intrepid journalist. You know, where was, where did WikiLeaks come from? And Julian Assange, right? It came out of that strange, weird internet world David was talking about that people thought was a tennis match. And I guess in some ways it kind of is <laughs> with, with bouncing leaks and information. Um, but, you know, I think it's easy for people to get overwhelmed. And I think it's easy for people to default to what's easiest for them. But I would ask that people do a few simple things. Um, and we have this at the Project Censored site, right? Uh, five ways to flex your media muscles. Um, I would add, and it doesn't have to be five, but, you know, reduce the amount of junk food news and infotainment you take in. Uh, always question your sources and who's funding sources of the information you're looking at. Always ask qui bono, who benefits from the information's being presented and the information's being suppressed. Ask yourself why you might be unfamiliar with a story or a certain perspective, right? Broaden your news frame, right? Remember to not only be a critical thinker, but a critical and compassionate listener as well. And when you're sharing information with people, think about, think about the, the art of argumentation as a construction zone, not a combat zone, right? Think about how we build ideas off of each other. Like David was referencing in the 60s when you had the free speech movement, you had the anti-war movement, you had uh, you know, Betty for Dan and, and, and the next reiteration of feminism. You had ethnic studies departments sprouting out to, to right the wrongs of white supremacist narratives in our history, in our educational institutions, and in our media. Those groups all were synergetic. They all worked in, they had conflicts, but when you look at them historically and how they, they vibe together, they, they, they give us a new generation of people that think differently and think more holistically. And I was born in 1970. And I, I'm a, a beneficiary of those things that came before me. And so one of I like to do with Project Censored and as an educator is I try to do as many of these things to pass along these ideas and pass along these networks as invitations to anybody that hears this, that they have a place at that table and they have the next great idea that's waiting to be hatched. And I think the free press is where those ideas are, 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 are um, vigorously argued and where they rise and fall. And I think we all suffer from censorship. We all suffer from deplatforming. We all suffer when voices are being suppressed, even the ones we don't wanna hear and even ones that are destructive. The way that we need to approach those is with more speech and constructive dialogue, censoring bad ideas and harmful ideas will always come back to haunt us as a society. And we're kicking the can down the road in many ways when we don't deal with the challenges that we face. And I would, I would end with that and uh, hope that everybody might take a little bit of that with them so that when you're next time talking to your uncle about QAnon um, and how March 4th is gonna be the great insurrection, maybe you can start asking some critical questions. Maybe you can start dialoguing about what, uh, where is this information coming from and is it being verified and what's driving that kind of thinking in the first place? So, and again, I think we, we need a vibrant and open free press to help us sort of mitigate all of these different ideas and perspectives and sort of put them in the big stew that is life, you know, and we're all on this really crazy and interesting ride. And I would encourage every single one of you to, to enjoy every single minute of it.
And may you be as blessed as I to be 50 and David now to be uh, coming into com coming up on seven generations on the planet as Ken is. Um, make your life worth living. You're here. Ken? We lost him. Gotcha. Here I am. <laughs> I know. I there's, some action in the, there's some action in the room. Yeah, Seldes was great. Yeah, Seldes was great. Um, <laughs> well, you know, Dylan uh, Davis, the guy, the guy that, um, the guy that was the former clan, uh, for, uh, the guy that worked went out and works with former clans members and converts people to Daryl right. Davis, uh, that can you know helps talk with people that belong to the clan and talks to them sometimes for ten or fifteen minutes and and they have this whole different opening about the way they see the world. You know, I hear a lot of people on the left talk about how some people can't be talked to. And that really, um, I can't say it frightens me because I'm not scared of it. I think it's just misguided. Mm -hmm. And it worries me, I think is the better word, that as soon as you write people off as unreachable, you'll mm -hmm. guarantee that you don't reach them. Well said. Uh, Dave, we have about five minutes just to uh, maybe finish up if you're willing. Uh, so just where do we go from here in the sense of, uh, you know, what does the future look like? What are your hopes and concerns? And then we'll take some questions and answers. Uh, Ken, that was for me? Yes. Okay. Uh, all yours. Well, you know, I, I, I can't lecture people who are, you know, in their 20s. Uh, I have sons in their 20s. Joe is 30, uh, the filmmaker, but my younger son is only 26. And, uh, you know, I learned from them. So I, I'm eager to hear uh, questions from your uh, students uh, about what uh, they feel they're facing as they, uh, you know, look into the future. All I can say is uh, to repeat what Mickey said, um, try to go about what you're doing, not, you know, in a, like you're a, a kind of driven automaton that you have to fit into their system the way it is, the matrix, the way it is now, try and be invented you know, make, make the news of your own, like Scoop Nisker said. And if you go into it with that attitude, you'll find other people, there are lots of rebels in every generation. I know people in their 20s, they hang out at my house all the time. Uh, and I love talking to them before the pandemic. Um, and, uh, you know, and it's going to be like that again. I think I'm looking forward to America opening up in a way that we haven't for a long time. Uh, you know, I think the Trump years were four very dark, very painful, very traumatic years. I think I agree with Mickey that there's a lot of people who are part of the Trump army that we can bring over to our side through dialogue, through talking with them or working with them. Mm -hmm. I think we have to think big. It's a time to think big. And your generation, I think, is in a position to lift this country up to the next level. And we really need to get there to save the climate, to save the environment, to save the world. I mean, the challenges you have are just, you know, are overwhelming in a way. They're existential challenges, but it's also a huge opportunity. And I've been blogging about that, even about San Francisco, because that's kind of my turf. You know, I wrote the book Season of the Witch, which is about, you know, the uh, efforts to liberate San Francisco in the 1960s and 70s and with great success. Uh, and now we're facing a, a situation where a lot of the tech workforce, the digital workforce is going back home because they can work remotely and they're leaving. The city seems kind of hollowed out in an interesting way to me as I ride around um, and look at the city nowadays. Uh, I think we have a great opportunity to remake San Francisco and we have a great opportunity to remake this country, your generation does. And so, you know, go for it, you guys. I think it's going to be a really exciting uh, future. Perfect. Thank You're you. Here. <laughs> so uh, let's check in. Lily, have you been looking at the chat or there are a series of people with questions? I see uh, a couple of people with, uh, I know Amika's got a question, looks like. Uh, do you have a list going, Lily? Most of them have been addressed mostly by Mickey in the chat, but um, okay. I will take a look and see if I can find any. Okay, gather them if you would. And Abika, let's start with you. Do you have a question? Yes. Hi. Um, thanks. Uh, thanks for the talk. This has been really um, illuminating. 
Um, I just wanted to kind of ask you something about like deplatformization and censorship in any form. And I just, it brought to mind, I watched recently this documentary, I think it was like a frontline um, one hour doc about Infowars and Alex Jones and um, Roger Stone and how like the, they establish in this film that there is like a line crossed with disinformation when you're like inciting violence, when you're denying that school shootings happened and that people like lost children. And, you know, there, there's, a, there's a certain point where it becomes dangerous for society. But that, I mean, it is censorship to deplatform these people or even President Trump from Twitter or, you know, um, can you respond to that? Yeah, absolutely. And I know David can, but I'm going to jump in because I've just been interviewing Grant about this and writing about this nonstop. We have another article coming out next week about it. I just put a Mint Press article. Our me critical media literacy conference was deplatformed from YouTube last fall. So it's not just Alex Jones they're coming after, and that's my problem. First of all, the, there's a big problem with the, the big tech companies are private for profit, even though they got a bunch of seed money and taxpayer money, and they can't really operate without government and taxpayer funding and permission. So they pretend like that has that exempts them from the First Amendment, and there are cases in the courts that are going through to deal with that. But because they're proprietary, they're allowed to deplatform or do whatever they want. What we argue is that these five or six corporations now function as a de facto public sphere, because between YouTube and Facebook and Twitter, that's where millions upon millions upon millions of people are going, not just to um, get information, but also to be heard, right? And so we've got to really redefine what that means and how the First Amendment applies. But now back to the First Amendment and why it should apply to those, in, uh, those types of institutions is because the free speech that we're talking about, the free press rights we're talking about, Alex Jones does not have the right to say false things without consequences. We have a uh, hundred plus years on the books of legal decisions about what free speech looks like. There are restrictions. Libel and slander are not protected. Inciting violence and rioting, not protected. Hate speech, not protected. We already have laws. They need to be enforced, right? And part of that problem is that we've allowed a handful of people, fewer people that are in this room right now, to decide what you're allowed to hear, read, and see on digital platforms, and that's techno-fascism. There is no place in a free society for that group of people to control what we get to hear, read, and see. Now, to your other point, does that mean that these people have a right to incite violence? Or And we've, we've written about Alex Jones. We've actually, Nolan Higdon, years ago, did a, a huge document on our website. You can look, it's called Disinfo Wars is what it's called. And it goes down a whole laundry list of the things that that guy gets wrong. But it also warns that people who celebrate the censorship of unpopular people will soon turn around to find themselves not far behind. And that's the thing that we have to have a balance with. But in order to have the balance, we have to have people that are educated in terms of critical media literacy. We have to have a society of critical and compassionate thinkers. We have to have people that are civically engaged and educated about how our civic civil society functions and for whom. Right. And so when you put all of those things in, right, then we can start to have a conversation about what's happening with deplatforming. Right. So this yeah, is I, I think, Mikita, uh, I agree with much of what you say. And uh, we, uh, when we were running a salon, we very much had a very libertarian point of view. Um, and we I think we you know, weighed in on the Communications Decency Act and uh, as one of the uh, plaintiffs, you know, trying to block that uh, legislation because we thought it was a big brother attempt to take over the internet and there have been several since then. Um, so I'm very aware of the problem of once you panic people uh, about violence and so on, uh, that the left can be equally uh, repressed uh, as well as the right. But I do think, yes, there is a, a line that's crossed when President Trump says, take the Capitol and, mm -hmm. you know, violence ensues. Uh, I think, you know, Twitter and uh, Facebook, uh, you know, social media was right to finally boot him uh, off their platforms. Now, the problem is, of course, uh, that the lunatic right ultimately will find its own platform somewhere to go. And uh, you can never sort of like repress them entirely. But I do think that like if uh, you have a huge kind of reach as a social media giant, you do have some responsibility. And when uh, a leader like Trump start, or other countries, leaders have uh, used social media to rile up angry mobs and kill people. And I just think that's beyond the pale. You have to draw the line there.
So uh, yeah, incitement to violence for political reasons, you know, just should not be permitted. And you do have to drive those voices to the margins. You'll never eliminate them in a, our society. America is always going to have a lunatic fringe, uh, and a militarized lunatic fringe, by the way. Uh, more and more, these people have guns, uh, and uh, you know, I was just amazed actually that the mob that ran, overran the Capitol building on January six was it more heavily armed than it was. So that's the next time, though. Uh, sort of the next threat we have to look at down the line. And uh, so, yeah, but you know what? It goes back to ultimately what I was saying earlier, the best story wins. And so it's our job, our responsibility as creators of media to be more truthful and to be more compelling and not just kind of create media that's like, you're Spanish, it's good for you, but to create media like this documentary I saw on Netflix last night, uh, Made You Look, which was about the obscenity of the uh, uh, New York art world and how these forgers took, you know, uh, some very wealthy collectors uh, for, I think, over $80 million worth of forgeries, uh, Jackson Pollock's, Rothko's, Motherwell's, and so on, over a two decade period. It was because there was so much greed on the part of the collectors, the dealers, everyone. They wanted to believe that these paintings were uh, not forgeries. And uh, that was a, not explicitly political. It wasn't Michael Moore. But that documentary, I think, told us more about class in America and uh, about you know the wealthy and how the wealthy continue to sort of operate in their own little bubble worlds more than any documentary I've seen recently. So that's our challenge as creators of media to do it better than the far right is doing it. So Ambika, I put a link to the Black Agenda Report and Garrison, an independent journalist, KPFA and other places just did an interview with me. And it is on a big, tense, big tech's algorithmic cancel culture. And so there's an interview there where I actually go into detail about exactly the question that you brought up. So I, I'm just leaving some litter over there in the comment area to follow up upon. And I also left my email address, Mickey at projectcensored.org. So if anybody in class wants to contact me, get involved with Project Censored or ask other questions, I'm more than happy to continue the conversation. And also just to acknowledge the Project Censored group will meet uh, right after class at 3.30. So stay on and anyone's interested, come, come share on this uh, same link. Christina, you've got a question. Hi, um, Mickey and David, I just wanna say, um, it's an honor to meet both of you. Um, I am part of Project Centered here at SF State and I wanted to ask, um, what are good ways uh, reaching out and collaborating with others when you're performing digital, dig digitally in journalism? David? Uh, Since you started all this mess back. I, <laughs> you know, um, not to like use Joe, my son, a lot, <laughs> but he took a class at City College and he met two or three other people who later became key collaborators of his on the, the film, The Last Black Man. And uh, I think that's what, you know, being a student is all about these days uh, and always has been. It's to make connections with other people who share your values and share your dreams. And uh, it's not just about, you know, listening to people like us in classroom or can as, as brilliant as we are. Um, it's about, you know, sort of uh, person to person connections that you make. And so when I said it was like building a band, you know, that, that was my kind of, um, you know, sort of ambition when I was young, because music was so important to me when I was growing up in the 60s and 70s, music meant everything to me. And so creating your own band was the paradigm. That was the, that was the kind of, you know, kind of uh, mission that we all felt we wanted to do. And I was able to do that journalistically with Salon. That was my band. Those men, those women, I felt like I would have gone through hell for them, you know, and we did go through hell. There, we had bomb threats, we had, you know, advertising boycotts, we had, you know, Tom DeLay, who was a, a viper in the US Congress at the time from Texas, get up. He was the whip, the GOP whip in Congress at the time. And he, I watched in the news on my way to work one morning, he got up and said, the FBI needs to investigate Salon, my publication, um, because of what we were printing at the time. So, uh, you know, I think 
that uh, particularly, you know, when you go through the kind of um, trial by fire that Salon did, you know who your friends are, you know who you can count on, you know who's in your tribe, who's in your band. But I think that's what you all need to think about doing more and more. The world is going to become increasingly, I think, scary, frankly, for a lot of people, economically, environmentally, and so on. And I think that if we don't build networks, tribes, family, but the extended family, uh, then we're all going to feel very isolated and very kind of, I think, um, you know, vulnerable. And so it's not just professionally what I'm saying to you, it's also personally that you need to find your tribe and you can start doing it right now with people that you're going to school with that you know. I mean, it's a weird time right now. We're all on Zoom. It's all sort of weird and, and remote. But you know, soon we'll be back in classrooms. Soon you'll be seeing other people in a real way. And uh, you know, use your time as a student. That's why I tell my own sons. Uh, you know, I mean, Joe's out of school now, but my youngest son is still in school. And use this time well. Uh, I went to UC Santa Cruz. I'm a banana slug. It was the only school that would let me in because I got kicked out of high school for opposing the war in Vietnam. I went to a military school in LA and I'm so glad I went to Santa Cruz because I found people who were like me. And uh, some of those friendships have stayed with me forever. And uh, you know, again, we were fighting a war. We were, we were doing politics and we were all in it together at Santa Cruz. And it was, we always felt that we were doing something bigger than our, our own uh, kind of ambitions. And so that's what I would encourage all of you to do. Come together through your values, your, your aspirations, your mission, and uh, you know, create your own story. Wow, David, Vicki, it's, it's really been great. We, we've, we've run out of time. Everything David said times two. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, both of you have been real gifts uh, for our group, for our circle. And thank you both for really for coming and for all you've shared today. So thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Ken. Thank you honor, all. Honor to be here. And it's always an honor to be with David. And uh, heed David's advice. He's full of good advice and get his new book when it comes out. It'll be out in June. <clears throat> Look forward to that. And David, when it does, let's, let's invite you back. Here it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he'll be on the Project okay. Censored show. And I, I linked to his site there, the davidtalbotshow.com. You can get all of his books there. And, the, and Project, at, the Project Censored show airs when, Mickey? Every Friday, 1 o'clock, KPFA 94.1 FM, online all the time. Um, projectcensored.org. We've got the radio link there. Our movies are there for free. Our stories, everything. Dave is talking about a band. I grew up as a musician. Project Censored has been my band now for at least the last 10 years and i'm jamming with some of the some great people and anybody here that wants to come along and jam you know how to get a hold of us through ken burrows <laughs> thanks again you two it's been great absolutely man my pleasure yep. and thanks everybody stay on if we can answer a question you didn't get but, uh, uh, we'll see you next monday for the class yeah, Bye, i can stick, i can stick around for a minute in case anybody needs anything ken that'd be great Mickey. thank you Bye, everybody.